G'day, my name's Kieran Lee and I'm the Senior Colourist here at Animal Logic. So I got into post in a slightly unconventional way. I didn't start off in the editorial department or a lab or a tape room or anything like that. I actually started off on set. Um, I was a camera assistant and then a camera operator working mostly on commercials. So I have kind of found my love for color grading by grading my own material. Um, I would use like the edit software we were using at the time and I was kind of amazed at how far you could push and pull an image around, how you could create looks or even hide some of the mistakes that I would shoot on set. Um, and that kind of really piqued my interest in color grading and sent me down the path of wanting to be a colorist. Um, I saw a job advertised here at Animal Logic. It was on Walking with Dinosaurs 3D. It was a review assistant role, um, but it was using the color grading software that we were using at the time. Um, so I essentially reset my whole career um, and spent the first couple of years here just learning as much as I could about color grading, about imagery, about VFX and CG and all that kind of stuff and just grading as much as I could. Uh, the first film that I actually got to do some grading was uh, the Lego Batman film. I took care of the Phantom Zone scene, so they're just these vivid pinks and purples and just uh, the scene's wild. Um, and also the, the big action set pieces at the end. So a lot of the work that we do here at Animal Logic is on animated feature films. And I want to start by saying, if you get the chance to work on an animated feature, just jump at it. They're like a pleasure to grade. Uh, here at Animal, everything is CG rendered. So you've got like nearly infinite dynamic range. Um, there's, there's values in our shots that cannot be captured by camera. Um, they're just that bright, that saturated. Um, we also get like, just this delicious package of mats and image tracks. So I, I get mats so I can manipulate pretty much every part of a character, whole characters, sets, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we also get these really, really handy image tracks that include things like flares and lens grime and lens dirt and, and just different elements that are sweeteners for shots. Um, so in saying all this, I'd say the biggest challenge about grading animated features is too many options. Um, you can quickly go down the rabbit hole and end up in a pretty sticky situation if you're not careful. So I find that making sure that you've got a solid plan when it comes to uh, animated feature grade really, really, really helps. Um, even when doing the balance pass, sometimes I'm like, oh, there's a mat for that. I'll just reach for the mats. And then I find myself, you know, 45 layers deep. Um, with a nice looking shot, but there's no way that I'm gonna be able to match anything next to it. Um, and I probably could have just got there with like one or two tools. So one of the franchises I've been lucky enough to be a part of since its inception is the Lego Movie franchise. These films are, they're, they're beautiful, they're, they're so vibrant, they're so <laughs> saturated, uh, probably pushing the bounds of how saturated a film can be. Um, where this gets tricky is going out to all the different deliverables you have to deliver to, each with their own kind of quirks and limitations. So in Baselight, we're completely color managed. We use ACES as our color pipe, and that's not just for color grading, that's company-wide. Um, from art department all the way down to us, everyone uses ACES, and it means that things look consistent and right between departments. Where it really helps me is doing those final deliverables. Um, I just check the correct ODT for the device that I'm going to and it gets you most of the way there. Um, you, you might have some minor trims just to make it look as good as it can, but it, it gets you most of the way there. Uh, where it gets a little bit tricky though is HDR. HDR, especially on animated CG films, when you've been looking at it through an SDR curve the whole time, um, they can be a bit of a surprise because we've got nearly infinite <laughs> like dynamic range and saturation. When you pop the image out into HDR, you kind of get a surprise. It's super saturated, super vibrant, and it's got a lot of things that you didn't see before. So to tackle this, we, we make sure that we dip in and out of HDR throughout the whole project, even though the main deliverable is the, you know, the P3 three, theatrical deliverable. Um, and what this allows us to do is to make sure that we're not breaking things in the grade um, that will you know, impact the HDR deliverable at the end. So there's many reasons why I choose Baselight for our CG productions here at Animal. Um, 
I think one of the big things is just the amount of color tools that you've got. Um, when breaking down a shot, I'll use the color temp exposure tool to do the initial balance. I'll use base grade or film grade to set the contrast. Um, and then I'll use video grade or curves to set a look or something like that. So just having that arsenal just means you've got so many different ways you can attack a shot. I think the other thing is base light is layer based. And to me, that kind of just makes sense. Um, it helps with organizing the stack. Um, I, I color code everything in our stack so everything is very visible. But when it comes to adding a lot of mats, um, we've got a gallery with a bunch of different presets that we can just insert in a really, really elegant way. And it just means I'm super quick in session. So one trick that I want to show is how to use a vector scope to balance a white point. But a trick that's kind of been handed down throughout Animal Logic is using the vector scope to do a balance. So if I've got this shot here from the LEGO Movie 2, it's quite warm. If I wanted to white balance this white cup here, um, what I would do is grab the vector scope. I would change the contrast and the scale of it. So if I set the scale, I want to zoom right, right into the center of the vector scope because obviously the further you go out, the more saturated it is and, you know, the middle is white. So if I set that to 10, which is as much as you can zoom in, we're right in the center there. And I might also just change the contrast and lower it a little bit so we get some more values in there. There we go, something like that. So you can see here, if I was to zoom into this shot, so you can see that the white point of this cup is quite warm. It's, it's slightly off skew to the center. So what I would use is either the color temperature or base grade tool to, to white balance this shot. So because we are too warm, I'm gonna make it a bunch cooler. I'm gonna grab this old temp slider here. We've got now a cup that is completely neutral. We've taken all the warmth out of the shot and if I zoom back out, so now having used the vector scope, we have a nice kind of neutral starting point to start grading the shot. And it's a very, very quick way to get in and just neutralize as long as you've got a white reference. So I'm lucky to be a part of the core staff here at Animal Logic, and what that means is my department has become heavily integrated into the overall pipeline. Um, not only do we get these EXRs filled with mats and like um, image tracks and all that kind of stuff, if there's any issues with a shot, I can literally just walk down the hall to a department supervisor and we can get things fix really quickly. Um, we tend to jump onto a project a lot earlier than you usually would. Um, and what we do there is start working with the lighting and the comp department to see what looks we are going to execute in, in the grade um, and what things we can kind of take off their plate. And this kind of happens throughout the whole project. Um, we, it, it's a two-way street though, so we may have things that you know, we're trying to hit in grade, like a heavy look or something like that, that will actually kick back to the lighting and comp departments with, with a reference still going, hey, we, we, we can't get there, can you help us out? And in turn, they'll, they'll ask us to, like in the session, do, do little fixes on characters or little comp tricks and stuff like that. So it's just a very collaborative environment. And what that means is we're just very quick at making films. I'm gonna take you through a few organizational slash workflow tricks that I use on our productions here. Uh, so here's a base light scene. It's only got two clips in it at the moment, but the first thing I'm gonna do is change the color of the timeline. Uh, currently it's in uh, classic mode, uh, which is you know a nice slick look, but it doesn't help with color coding. And I use color coding a lot to keep my stack in check, but also to communicate to other people in the department. So if we go up to preferences, we're on the timeline tab here and we're going to change it from classic to flat. There you go, hit save. And now we've got two gray strips here. The next thing I'm gonna do is because we get so many different versions, um, I use color coding on the input strips to show the status of the shot. So yellow means it's whip, uh, fuchsia means it's final. And because these shots are both final, I'm gonna color them fuchsia right now. So just going up to our color picker, clicking on fuchsia, there you go. I know these shots are final. I know that I can work on them and deliver them. 
so now that we've got that fixed up, we can look at building a stack. Um, I'm not gonna build a stack from scratch because that's going to probably take way too long for a video like this. Um, but I can go through a bit of a pre-built stack that I have already. So if I apply this blank stack preset that I have in the gallery, you can see here, we've got a nice pre-built stack. So on layer one, um, it's, it's a dead layer. I use it for markers. So if I need to communicate to other people in the team, I'll put markers on layer one. Um, it means that when you're multi-pasting or you're up-versioning, you know, those markers stay with the shot. I'll also put categories and stuff as well. We, we kind of use this just as our marker strip. Uh, layer two here, I use a, a compressed gamut. If there's any values that are, you know, way too saturated or something like that, I can kind of nip them here um, and make sure that I'm working on something that's not, you know, going out of gamut and going to cause issues later. Then I've got this color temp expose tab. Um, you can see that it's literally just got the color temperature operator and a base grade operator in there. Everything else has been taken out just to make it nice and clean and make sure that you can't bump anything. Um, what I like about these two tools is they're color space aware and also the, um, the exposure is in stops, which is super handy when you're talking to DPs or, you know, VFX supervisors or people like that. Um, if, if they're like, I, I need this, you know, exposed up by half a stop, I'll type in 0.5 and there you go. We're up by half a stop. Very, very handy. So just resetting that. After that, that's kind of my balance layer where I'll just, you know, white balance and expose the shots. But after that, we kind of get into the grade. So I've got primary operators here. Um, this is where I'll generally do contrast and saturation. And if I'm going to, you know, push something into the, the shadows or highlights, I can kind of do that in that operator. Secondary, I usually leave for like uh, hue shifts and stuff like that. Um, and then I've got this look operator here that's got a bunch of look tabs in it. Um, but also curve grade and other operators that I would use to build, uh, you know, the look of a show. After every one of these uh, layers here, I've got a trim as well. Um, something that I've found handy over the last couple of films is, you know, if you set the contrast, but then you want to copy and paste it on a bunch of shots and then fix it on just one of those shots, um, you can fix that on the trim without, you know, potentially corrupting or polluting that, that operator. Um, so that's all pretty stock standard. Um, you will see though that we go from layer nine here all the way to layer 20. The reason for that is when you're copying and pasting or when you're working with like a, a big team, it really helps to make sure that the layer numbers don't switch. Um, so there's a bit of a gap here that, you know, if we were to fill up all of these layers, I could add a bunch um, without changing, you know, the layers that the keys are applied on or the shapes or the mats or anything like that. So I'm just going to clear those out. Um, I'll show you how I kind of do keys and shapes. It's, it's a similar vibe, but like if I was to, you know, key, say the purple here, I'll do a really, really, really dodgy key. Yep. That's pretty dodgy. Um, but I've done that key. I'm going to grade through that. What I would do is then name the strip. Uh, let's see if I can get that name. Yep. So if I go like purple key, something like that, and then I would grab those three little layers and I would give them a color. So if we go here to our kind of Macbeth style chart, oh, purple key, make it purple. Um, it just means that if someone has to dig in, they're not grabbing the wrong layer. They're not doing anything that they shouldn't, especially if you've got multiple keys, I'll quickly do another key here. Say we're de-keying the wall or something like that. I'd make that a different color. So you know, that's gray now, call it wall. Um, just so you can visually quickly see what things are doing. I'd say that compared to animated features, hybrid features tend to fare better from a lighter touch overall. Um, they take on heavy looks, like overall looks quite well. Like it, it's like any other film, like they're plate based, they're shot with a camera, that all works. But if you get too noodly when it comes to grade mats or, you know, isolating certain characters and stuff like that, you can quickly start to break the integration that the, the lighting and comp department have done. And it, it essentially breaks the shot. It starts to look weird. Um, so a lot of our work will be doing like very precise, subtle color adjustments on the, the Peter Rabbit films. We, 
you know, we make sure that all the, the fur color is consistent and looking correct and the, you know, the jacket color is consistent and looking correct and all that kind of stuff. Um, if we are to start grading characters and bring them up and pop them out and all that kind of stuff, we tend to stay away from contact points. So if a rabbit is, you know, foot's hitting grass or something like that, we try to make sure that we're not hitting that point. So I do a lot of mat work with shapes and soft grads and stuff like that, just to make sure we're not breaking the shot.